you plug in the transmitter. Always remember to stretch the antenna out first before you plug it in. That way, the transmitter tunes itself for maximum range. The motor sound you may have heard after plugging it in was the transmitter tuning itself. Well, hello again everybody, and welcome to part two of our Talking House Transmitter video. Now, for those of you that haven't seen part one of this video, I actually suggest you go back and watch part one, because that will give you an explanation, really, of what we're doing today. So in part one of the video, I'm afraid, as usual, I just spent far too much time flapping my mouth and not really getting on with any testing, and uh, sorry about that, but this was a new product to me and I was just trying to get a feel for it. So we're actually going to be doing some test and measurements on this uh, transmitter today. So you can see one thing, that this has got two antenna connectors on it. It's got this one that's designed for internal use, and we've also got another cable plugged in, which is to this outdoor antenna. So I've chosen to use this outdoor antenna socket because it's actually easier to couple the signal into test equipment. So we've actually flicked this selector switch from the basic to the outdoor setting and uh, what's also happened is we can now see we've got a rewarding little red light here on the front of the unit to tell us that we're using this outdoor antenna option. So looking at the antenna connector on our talking house transmitter, this is what they call an F-type connector and it's the sort of thing you find on the back of uh, things like satellite receivers and stuff like that. So this F-type connector, it's got a basic impedance of 75 ohms. Now reading through the manual for this talking house transmitter, it does mention an RG6 coax. And again, looking up the specification for an RG6 coax, that actually gives us another 75 ohm cable. So I'm guessing that the, uh, the, the impedance of this system, everything is designed to be 75 ohms. Well I thought we could start off today by doing some very simple performance measurements on the output from our transmitter. So we've taken the RF output via this 75 ohm cable and this is actually going into what they call a matching pad. Now a lot of oscilloscopes and things uh, they don't have 75 ohm or typically even 50 ohm inputs. They actually tend to have uh, high impedance inputs. Now it's typically a good idea when you're working on RF systems to actually terminate everything in its characteristic impedance. Now it probably wouldn't make a whole lot of difference because we're actually working at a very low frequency here. It's pretty much uh, it's only 1.5 megahertz, so it's really low frequency. So you'd probably get away with using without using any terminations, but it's pretty good practice. Now this is a also this is a terminator, a 75 ohm to 50 ohm impedance converter. And the other thing that this does, it's also an attenuation pad that drops the power down by about 10 dBs. So I've actually got it written on here. It says uh, it says 9.61 dBs. So this is a homemade attenuator pad. In fact, the main purpose is it is to convert between 75 and 50 ohms but you never get something for nothing so in doing that conversion between 75 and 50 ohms you actually introduce some attenuation which is usually a good thing but it's worth pointing out that this is actually a very low powered attenuator it's just made up using a couple of quarter watt resistors so depending on what type of transmitter you're testing you might have to use uh, something different to this certainly you wouldn't want to uh, connect one of your uh, radio ham type 100 watt transceivers. The output from the talking house transmitter should be somewhere around 100 milliwatts and the resistors in here are rated about a quarter watt so we should be fine but again be very careful. So again we're taking the output from the transmitter we're going into this matching pad which converts between 75 to 50 ohms into a 50 ohm coax and that goes to the oscilloscope here but because the oscilloscope again that doesn't have a 50 ohm input impedance so I've also got um, a 50 ohm matching pad in here so in, in theory everything is correctly terminated in what they call the characteristic impedances now as I said earlier it probably won't make much of a difference at such low frequencies but it's good practice so that's why I'm doing it like this now when testing a transmitter I think the best place to start is just to have a look at a dead carrier. So a dead carrier is basically the output waveform from the transmitter that isn't being modulated. So we need to have no audio signal going into our transmitter. So as you saw earlier we've got a switch here so we can switch between an internal recorded message or we can also switch to this live radio. Now if you've got the switch into the live radio uh, position here, it can get its audio inputs from a few different positions. I think there's a there's a, an electret mic installed inside this unit, so you can actually shout into it if you want and pre-record your message, uh, it, but it will also transmit that. The other source of audio is via these two 
little jack plugs here. So you've got a microphone level audio input and you've also got a line level audio input which it says it's a maximum of 500 millivolts there. So what we're going to do is, I don't want any audio going into this at the moment so I'm going to put in effectively a shorting plug. So within this connector here there's just a 600 ohm resistor which is connected to ground because I'm guessing that the audio impedance for the line input is 600 ohms, not that it matters. The most important thing is that we don't want anything floating, we don't want any of the audio input stage just picking up mains hum and stuff like that because it won't help us. So by actually just grounding this input it's a bit fairer when we come to test the transmitter. So I've got the radio receiver tuned into the dead carrier at the moment so let's just prove that. So let's turn the transmitter off now. So you can hear that the static level has risen because the output from the transmitter is actually quieting the radio receiver. OK, let's switch the transmitter back on now. And you can see there that the radio receiver is now quieted again. So here's our unmodulated carrier. So what we can do is we can use the oscilloscope's time base control. Let's just speed up the time base and we should start to see a nice sine wave. So having just zoomed in here on our carrier, it doesn't look like a totally awful sine wave, but I'm actually seeing quite a bit of distortion. Now you might be saying, well, how do you know there's quite a bit of distortion there? And all I can say is that's because I'm used to looking at uh, sine waves and I can see that there's kind of a, a flat section here. Well, it's the same there. There's a flat section there. It's kind of overly rounded. It's as though the sine wave is extended. It shouldn't actually carry on. It shouldn't be as wide as that at this point. So it's got a definite flat section there. It's also got a very flat section there. Now this section here seems a little bit more pointed than it should be. Now to actually look at sine waves, typically you won't be able to see, and, and I've got to admit, neither can I, the human vision, I think it's sensitive to, it needs to be about 10% distortion on a sine wave before you can spot it. Now interestingly enough, if we had another perfect sine wave which we could lay on top of here as an example, it would then be more obvious that this uh, this waveform is distorted but I'm not going to do that today but if you're not sure uh, get another signal generator and uh, put it on channel 2 and put another sine wave in from a source that you trust and you'll be able to spot uh, you'll be able to compare one sine wave to the other and you'll see that distortion now you say well what does it matter about distortion who cares it looks pretty good to me well the problem is that this distortion that we've got on this sine wave it's going to show up in the transmitted signal as um, as modulation products so what you'll find is we're going to suffer from things like uh, I don't know second and third harmonic so we're going to be transmitting on the fundamental but because we've got this distortion we're also going to be transmitting on the uh, on the second harmonic and probably the uh, the third and the fifth etc etc so um, it could be a problem this, the fact that it's deviating from what I would call a pure sine wave. Certainly if I was to look at some of my ham radio transmitters I would expect to see something a bit tidier than this. Now the other thing I'm seeing is sat right on the top and the bottom of our dead carrier here we can see some noise. Now I would be interesting to see what frequency this noise is at because it might give me a clue to some of the hum and the nastiness we hear coming out of this transmitter. Because I've said earlier, this transmitter does actually seem to suffer from grounding issues or, or ground loop problems. I haven't quite put my finger on it. It seems to be very variable. It's related to what power supply you use, what antenna you use, where you position the antenna. It seems like there's a number of different elements which, which contribute towards this being, transmitter being quite noisy and producing quite an undesirable kind of hum in the background to any signal it's transmitting. So I'm wondering if this noise that's floating at the top and the bottom of our carrier here is contributing to that. It certainly could be. So I think what we'll do is we'll try and make that a little bit more obvious. Okay, that's about as big as I can make it. Oh, don't you hate touch screens? I'm just going to freeze that. Let's zoom in a little bit. Now hopefully you can see we've got a couple of little noise peaks here. We've got one there and one there. So what I want to do is I want to get some timing information from these noise peaks because it might help to suggest where that's coming from. Well as you can see I've positioned our two cursors here, X1 and X2. 
and I've got the actual output from the oscilloscope. It's set to display a delta in frequency, so it's telling me that our x delta is a uh, is a hundred hertz. So that's quite interesting in itself. So a hundred hertz. Well, our main frequency here is fifty hertz. So we appear to be getting some hundred hertz ripple. Now, typically, you probably find hundred hertz ripple being produced in things like solid state rectifiers. So that could be one source of our hundred hertz ripple. But there's lots of other places it could be coming from. It could also be just a harmonic of the mains frequency. So it could be that. It could be something that's actually being uh, picked up from something in this room itself, like my LED lighting or something like that. Although I have tried turning that the lighting off and nothing really seems to affect it. So I think that this noise is being generated internally. Now having said that, this does use a, a wall warp power supply and I've tried a couple of different power supplies and they seem to have no effect on this uh, on this mains hum. Shall we just try proving that? Let's just try maybe plugging in one of those switch mode supplies that we were messing with earlier. So as you can see I've gone ahead and I've unplugged the transformer based power supply and I've plugged in a switch mode power supply and I'm looking at the uh, the noise here on the output carrier. Now it's probably quite hard for you to see, it's actually hard for me to see so it looks like the amplitude of the noise has reduced but also the frequency so I can actually see where the, the markers were set before to, to give this 100 hertz ripple that we were seeing. Now looking at it I can see many 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 peaks now let me just freeze it. I can see many little peaks here between these 200 hertz. Although the actual noise is such a, such a low level it's difficult to actually discriminate it. Well it's probably quite hard to see but I found a couple of little sproggy spikes on top of the output waveform here which I believe are coming from the switch mode. So I've gone ahead and I've set up our delta cursors onto those little noise spikes and that's come out as being now a delta x of well 23 kilohertz so I'm guessing that 23 kilohertz that's the free switching frequency of the switch mode power supply so it does appear that in some ways uh, the switch mode power supply is actually less noisy than the actual linear transformer based supply because you know switch modes aren't all bad uh, even linear supplies have their problems to do with the uh, the switching diodes in them so it could be that a switch mode power supply could be made to work quite well of course it needs to be suitably grounded though so I'm not hearing any mains hum at the moment I can hear a little bit of background hiss but I'm certainly not hearing any mains hum let's try see if we can hear anything different with the other power supply in place so that's on the switch mode Oh you can, can you hear that? Can you hear the 100 hertz hum? I certainly can, so that's working off the uh, the transformer based wall wart. Let's plug the switch mode back in. So there's actually less noise coming off our radio here using a switch mode power supply than there is using the actual uh, uh, conventional transformer so there you go switch modes all is forgiven come back so you know although we all give switch mode power supplies a bad name and I do as well in this particular application the uh, the switch mode actually outperforms the linear power supply but I suggest that's got more to say about the uh, quality of the linear supply which is supplied with the talking house transmitter than actually the quality of the switch mode now to keep everything honest I've just unplugged the switch mode and we're going to continue to use the uh, transformer based power supply for the rest of these tests. Well while we've got the oscilloscope plugged in we may as well just go ahead and do a quick power measurement. So we've got our carrier wave here which again is unmodulated. So we're actually going to be measuring the peak power because we're going to get the maximum power when there's no modulation taking place. So in order to do our power measurement we're going to use the formula V squared over R, V squared over R. So what we need for V is we need the RMS voltage. So I could actually go ahead and I could work this out longhand but luckily for me this scope does actually read it off directly off a measurement. So here it gives the AC RMS voltage of about 1.01 volt I'm going to go for, 1.01 volt. Now you remember earlier that we've got this uh, 75 ohm matching pad on it. So this has actually got a voltage radio of about 3 to 1. So any signal um, 
that appears on the 50 ohm side will actually be three times smaller than the signal on the input to our uh, matching pad. So I've got to take in that uh, ratio into account. Now I've got it written as a voltage ratio here. Of course that also equates to about 10 dB as well. But So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to type that numbers into our calculator. So we take our calculator, switch it on there. So we need our RMS voltage which is 1.01 1.01 going to multiply that by this uh, this voltage ratio here which is 3.02 and that gives us 3.05 so we then have to square that which gives us 9.3 and then we're going to divide that by 50 ohms because on this side of the pad we were dealing with a 50 ohm system rather than a 75 ohm so let's just divide that by 50 ohms equals 0 0.18 so we're actually recording here 186 milliwatts which is considerably more than I was expecting now according to the part 15 compliance for this talking house transmitter the maximum output power is only 100 milliwatts well it does seem to be doing considerably more than 100 milliwatts it's actually doing closer to 200 milliwatts I guess the question is how much of that 200 milliwatts is actually in band I suspect when we plug the spectrum analyzer in, we're going to see uh, quite a lot of harmonics but before we plug the spectrum analyzer in I think let's go ahead and just have a look at the effect of modulation on our waveform so to take a look at the modulation on the oscilloscope I'm actually going to use this RF test set here but I'm not actually using it as a test set I'm actually to start with I'm just going to use it as an audio frequency signal generator so squirting out of this uh, connector here we're going to get an AF signal I'm just looking at what I've got it set to at the moment and uh, if I just squint at it well it actually looks as though I've got my audio signal generator set to about 600 hertz and 100 millivolts input I think I'm just going to go and uh, make some changes to that so I'm going to set the, the frequency to 1 kilohertz and to start with let's turn the actual generator off or certainly turn it down to a low level okay so I have I've turned it off I've got 0 millivolts so we've got our AF signal here coming out of the test set now because I've found that this transmitter is exceptionally sensitive to things like ground loops it creates an awful lot of noise I'm going to try to minimize one of the ground loops by using this ground braid breaker so all this is it's an audio frequency isolation transformer so basically there's no connection between the actual signal generator here and the transmitter the only connection is through a transformer so there's no direct copper connection the connection between the two is transformer coupled so these are very useful and in fact I would say if you're planning on using one of these uh, transmitters and maybe your audio source is going to be another radio that plugs in or a tape deck that plugs in it's pretty essential that you go ahead and you purchase one of these high quality noise suppressors and isolation transformers I seem to think that I bought this on Amazon a few years ago it's about 15 pounds now I'm sure you remember we actually had our uh, input to our transmitter we had it terminated in a 600 ohm resistor so I'm going to unplug that now and I'm going to replace that now with our audio output from our signal generator so our audio output from our signal generator is now connected to the audio input of our transmitter so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start to increase the AF level which is going into our transmitter and the transmitter should respond to actually putting some modulation on here at about uh, well exactly one kilohertz so let me go ahead and start to adjust that now so we've got an audio signal now of 30 millivolts peak to peak going into our transmitter and our transmitter has responded by producing uh, modulation of the carrier so if we were to look at the uh, spacing between here and here we'd actually see that that would actually correspond to the audio frequency so here is our audio sat on top of our carrier wave here that are interested what we can do is we can just prove that by bringing in a couple of cursors let's zoom in a little bit just to make it a bit easier to line the cursors up So we'll go pretty much to the top of that one and the top of that one there. 
And you can see here on the uh, oscilloscope now, it's telling us that this sine wave is uh, 1 kilohertz. Well, of course it is, because that's what we've set the AF generator to, 1 kilohertz. And just to prove that, I'm just going to go ahead now and I'm going to adjust the AF frequency from 1 kilohertz to 2 kilohertz. And what we should see is, we should see about as twice as many uh, peaks in there as we had before. So here we go, 2 kilohertz. I think that's close enough. It proves the principle. So that's 2.044 kilohertz now. I'm going to go back to 1 kilohertz though because people tend to use 1 kilohertz as a standard test frequency. So I've set the signal generator back to 1 kilohertz now and now I'm going to adjust the frequency from 30 millivolts input to actually 50 millivolts. So let me do that now. And hopefully you can see the modulation now has become deeper. So we have, they often express this as percentage modulation. So you can see we've got a little bit more modulation. I'm going to put a bigger step in now. I'm going to go to 100 millivolts. And it's quite interesting to see now there is definitely some asymmetry in our waveform here in that you look at the, uh, the height of the, the modulation here, it's certainly... It's a lot shallower at the, at the top of the wave than it is at the bottom of the wave. So we did notice that asymmetry before. So I'm guessing that that's some irregularity in the output stage of the transmitter. It's certainly not as uh, linear. It's not as perfect as it could be. So that's at uh, 100 millivolts. Let's go a little bit higher. Maybe we'll go to 120. So that's 120 millivolts. So with the audio level set to 120 millivolts, we're actually starting to see some distortion appear in our output waveform. I don't know if you can see, it's actually flat topping. It's actually now starting to overdrive the output from our transmitter. It's actually, the signal level is starting to get too high. So again, this means this is going to start now to introduce distortion into our output waveform that we're transmitting. But yeah, it's definitely starting to flat top there. Let's put another 10 millivolts on top of that. Right, okay, we're starting to see very obvious distortion now. So it's it's flat topping very obviously at the top and the bottom now and we've also lost our lovely smooth edges to this and we're starting to uh, get straight lines here so this transmitter these output transistors are going into saturation now so they're no longer working in a linear manner so this will be starting to create an awful lot of distortion and what I'm quite surprised about is the lack of effect of the limiting circuit and that it really hasn't limited the output level it hasn't limited or it hasn't limited the AF input to a safe level which is stopping these transistors the output transistors from going into saturation so that certainly isn't good let's keep pushing it a bit harder let's go for 200 millivolts quite a big jump and you can now see what I would call box cars the curves have now gone and we're getting very sharp edges it's a, it, these are yeah we call this a box car formation because it looks, like a, it looks like a row of trains all next to each other, or certainly that's one description of it. So with a 200 millivolt input to our talking house transmitter, the output will be severely distorted. Now we can probably hear that, we'll hear this as a, a square wave coming through in the audio of a receiver. So let's just prove that. I'm hoping you can hear that. This tone sounds, I can only describe it as sounding harsh quite a good thing to do if you've got a signal generator at home and a speaker try listening to a one kilohertz sine wave and then try and listen to a one kilohertz square wave and you'll actually be able to hear the difference now the reason that a square wave sounds horrible is because when you listen to a square wave you're not listening to one frequency if you listen to a sine wave you're only listening to a one kilohertz frequency but if you listen to a one kilohertz square wave well it contains a lot more than one kilohertz it actually contains an awful lot of ad -har odd harmonics and you, you can hear all those odd harmonics and they make it sound unpleasant so just to prove that I'm going to drop the modulation back to a more reasonable level now you can see it's now got a nice shape back to the waveform. Turn the volume up. And I'm hoping you can hear that sounds clearer. It doesn't sound quite so horrible and distorted. Let me try and show you the difference again. Can you hear that? Sounds really shrill. 
and back to 100. Sounds much better, doesn't it? So the absolute maximum signal you want to feed into this Talking House transmitter is something around 120 millivolts RMS. If you feed in more than that you're going to start to get distortion. Now not only will that distortion sound horrible on the receiving radio, the other thing that you will find is you'll also be generating a lot of harmonic products in the RF. So you'll be generating a lot of out of band transmissions. For example you're going to be generating harmonics at um, at around, well we're set to 1500, 1.5 megahertz at the moment, so we'd be generating harmonics, the, the, the second harmonic at about 3 megahertz and then the third harmonic at uh, 4.5 megahertz. So again, you want to keep the signal level down as low as you can to stop us generating all these spurious out of band transmissions. Congratulations, this talking house is using the dial on the back of the transmitter. So unfortunately, as you can hear, the actual audio quality coming out from our little uh, radio here, it's actually quite distorted. And now you'll understand why. The reason it sounds so distorted is because the pre-recorded message has been recorded at too high a audio level, which is actually causing this transmitter to transmit in a non-linear fashion, because we can quite clearly see that the waveform is being clipped. Well as you can see I've gone ahead and I've actually modified our test setup here so that we can bring the spectrum analyzer into play. So we've got the same RF signal coming out of our talking house transmitter here. So it's coming out of its uh, F connector which is 75 ohms. It's going into a match 75 ohm coax and then it's going into this matching pad that we looked at earlier which is changing the impedance from 75 ohms to 50 ohms because as I said earlier most of my test equipment including the spectrum analyzer here works on 50 ohms. We come out of the matching pad on 50 ohms and then we actually come into this Hadfield attenuator. So this Hadfield attenuator is adding some more attenuation and it's actually adding what I've got it set to uh, 10 and 20 so I'm actually adding another 30 dBs of attenuation here. So we've got 30 dBs of attenuation and we've got another 10 dBs of attenuation, well 9.6 dBs in our matching pad here. So we need to uh, add that back on to any signal because the signal going into our spectrum analyzer now is actually going to be lower than it is coming from the transmitter. So we need to add that signal back in when we do any calculations. So we'll do that in a moment. So we come out of our attenuator here on this side of it. Again, we come out into 50 ohms. Now, when we actually had the coaxial cable plugged into the oscilloscope, I had an additional terminator, a 50 ohm terminator resistor screwed onto the front of this coax cable. Well, we don't have that for a spectrum analyzer. And the reason we don't need that is because actually the impedance of the spectrum analyzer is actually 50 ohms so we don't need to add an additional resistor it can take 50 ohms so everything up to here is 50 ohms and then everything on this side of the matching pad is 75 ohms now there's a couple of reasons why I've chosen to add this attenuator now one of the reasons is because our signal level from our talking house transmitter here is above 100 milliwatts well the maximum signal level that can actually go into this spectrum analyzer is 20 dBm so that is around 100 milliwatts so we don't want to actually put more signal in than we should to our spectrum analyzer because it's quite likely we will damage it you must always be exceptionally careful when you're connecting any signal to your spectrum analyzer. These instruments are very, very easily damaged, so take great care when you're doing that. So we don't want to feed in more signal than we need to. Now the other reason we don't want to feed in a particularly high signal is at the front end of the spectrum analyzer is a mixer, and that mixer has transistors in it. If you put too high a signal into the front end of a spectrum analyzer, you're going to put those uh, that detector transistor, you're going to to put those into saturation and they're going to start creating distortion products. Now the problem with that is you then won't know whether those distortion products are part of the normal signal or whether those distortion products are being generated internally within the spectrum analyzer. The spectrum anal analyzer can't tell the difference it will just display them on the screen there so that's another good reason why you want to always keep the signal level going into your spectrum analyzer. Keep it as low as is reasonably practical so the power level at 1.5 megahertz is about 17 dBm. 
Now, of course, that's actually lower than is really coming out of the transmitters because we've got to add back the uh, or take off, in fact, the, uh, the the attenuation we've got in there. So we've got 9.6 dBs of attenuation coming from the matching pad and we've got another 30 dBs of attenuation coming from this Hatfield attenuator. So if we add minus 17 to plus 9.61 to plus 30 what we actually get is we get 22.41 dBm and if you do the conversion between dBm and milliwatts you'll find that that's about 170 milliwatts so again this talking house transmitter on its fundamental frequency it's already exceeding 100 watts uh, it's actually exceeding it by 70 watts now I have to admit I'm not dead sure that I'm doing these power measurements right I'm wondering if normal power measurements are actually specified at a certain uh, modulation percentage modulation I'm actually doing the test with a dead carrier so it might not be the uh, exactly the right thing to do I'm not certain if you know better than me leave it in the comments but certainly it seems a little bit str strange that the FCC regulation requires a transmitter to put out no more than 100 milliwatts of power and certainly we can see here again we're putting out about 170 milliwatts which is pretty much the reading that we were getting when we did the uh, test using the oscilloscope so these readings do agree with each other but I think what's more frightening looking at these and again going back to the oscilloscope I said that we could see some distortion in the sine wave well that distortion is now very very evident so here's the fundamental 1.5 megahertz Here's the second harmonic of that fundamental, which is at 3 MHz. Then we've got the third harmonic at 4.5. And then we've got the fourth harmonic here, which is actually at 6 MHz. So although our transmitter is only designed to be transmitting at a single frequency, which is 1.5 MHz, it's actually going to be transmitting at 3 MHz, 4.5 MHz and 6 MHz. So all these all these are uh, spurious transmissions these are all all out of bound transmissions they're out of the medium wave broadcast band so I actually think this is probably the worst transmitter I've ever seen when it comes to this harmonic content I'm just going to allow a little bit of RF to leak out of this uh, spectrum analyzer now because of course we're using shielded coax so in theory there shouldn't be a lot of RF leaking out of these cables now there would be some but I actually want a little bit more to leak out you could actually tune your radio into all of these harmonics these aren't something imaginary your talking house transmitter is now transmitting not just on its fundamental it's transmitting on the second third and fourth harmonic and in fact there's something on the fifth there so we should be able to tune our radio into all these harmonics so here's our fundamental signal on 1.5 megahertz. Congratulations. This talking house transmitter is a powerful Let's readjust the radio to 3 megahertz now. So again you can quite clearly hear it at 3 megahertz which is our second harmonic so the next one should be 4.5 so I can still hear that signal there at 4.5 megahertz now I don't think we're going to be able to hear it at 6 but part of the reason we're not going to hear it at 6 is because at the moment I've just got so much uh, attenuation in that's attenuating not just the main signal it's also uh, it's also attenuating these out of band trans by about 40 dBm it's attenuating it because we've got 10 here and uh, another 30 dBm set up in the in the hat field here so I think if you were using one of these talking house transmitters you really would have to be quite careful and do some monitoring to make sure that you weren't creating uh, a disturbance to other radio spectrum users because the out of band transmissions for this really is pretty poor I'm fairly sure I mentioned earlier that this talking house transmitter it has an internal ATU now the action of an ATU doesn't just tune the antenna it will also act as a notch filter to those out of band transmissions 
Now the problem is, my understanding is, the internal ATU is only used when we use this uh, this wire antenna here, this little internal antenna which is designed for indoor use. The ATU unfortunately doesn't tune the outdoor antenna. So I'm really hoping if we let this ATU tune itself up on its little wire antenna here, it shouldn't be generating those spurious out-of-band transmissions. So because we're actually transmitting into this wire and it's somewhat of an unknown impedance, it's not very easy to couple test equipment like a spectrum analyzer to it directly. So what I'm doing here is I'm just sniffing the RF so I've just got a piece of wire so this is the antenna wire here and this piece of wire is feeding to the input of the spectrum analyzer now this is quite a good way generally to uh, connect a, a spectrum analyzer to transmitters and stuff like that don't make a direct wire connection just use a short length of wire to sniff for RF um, because you would need a very very high power level to actually actually damage a spectrum analyzer in this way because there's no direct connection but even so you want to keep the wires just a little bit separated as I'm trying to do here. So I'm actually quite pleased that the action of this internal ATU has really brought some of those spurious out-of-band transmissions under control so this is the uh, this is the second harmonic which was actually at quite a high level before it was only I think 20 dBs under the main carrier so looking at it now it's actually 47 dBs under the carrier. Now again it's still not brilliant I would be hoping to see uh, a reading of somewhere near 60 dBs it might actually be a little bit better than this in the real world because we've also got some RF which is leaking directly out of the back of the cabinet which my spectrum analyzer will also be picking up via its length of pickup wire but certainly that's a lot better than it was before I'm also wondering if, if at that level there that minus uh, what is that? About minus 62 dB. I wonder if this radio receiver will still be able to pick it up at, um, at 3 megahertz. Let's find out. Yes. I think it is probably worth remembering that the RF output from this outdoor antenna connector really is quite poor in terms of uh, its spurious out-of-band transmissions. It really could, could have done with uh, some considerable low-pass filtering which doesn't seem to exist. Now in the real world it might not be such a problem if you're connecting this maybe via an external ATU. I would definitely recommend connecting an ATU and maybe if that's done in conjunction of something like uh, an antenna which is resonant with a high Q then maybe that will do something to suppress the spurious out-of-band transmissions. But what I would say is if you are planning on using this outdoor connector at least do some checking around and monitoring to make sure that you're not causing a nuisance to other radio spectrum users. While I was editing today's video I'm afraid I did actually notice some mistakes in the explanation that I gave that were just wrong about the problems with this transmitter. So certainly yes it does have a problem with out-of-band transmissions but I think I was implying that that was to do with the output stage being very non-linear because it was being overdriven because I talked about it being clipping when I was looking at the uh, the square tops of these. Uh, I'm afraid I was actually quite wrong about that when I gave it some more thought and uh, I can very easily show that if I just actually zoom in. So we can actually still see quite a nice sine wave there so it isn't actually the output transistors that are clipping and again we can just move this over to look at some of these uh, very fast rising edges so let's just zoom in and look at some of those. So you, hopefully you can see that. So the actual sine waves aren't all clipped, they're not distorted. So the clipping isn't taking place in the RF output stage, the clipping is actually taking place in the audio stage, the audio amplifier within the transmitter. So I didn't make that clear and I did misspeak so I'm sorry about that everybody. Yeah.